Hey, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for tuning in for another great program, I hope. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that in a few minutes. But um, as you know, we just had our elections, uh, and uh, this is our annual meeting. And at that meeting, we do announce the results of the election. And uh, for those of you who may not know how that works, um, a bylaw has actually set up a system in which we have a nominating committee that goes out and comes up with a slate of candidates. Uh, in this case, it was Joe Moses who was the uh, chairman of it, and Marty Jones and, and Jim Lecky uh, were on that committee. And uh, they solicited people to be on the um, uh, on the uh, on the slate if they want to run for an office. Um, the votes were uh, due by November 29th, and they were counted that evening. Uh, no one, of course, on the board uh, was involved in any of that. And they came up with a slate, and uh, everyone on the slate uh, was uh, was voted in formally, uh, uh, and uh, it was a pretty unanimous. Uh, and the way it works is uh, the nominating committee, the chair of that, Joel submits that slate to the board of directors at their meeting, which happened this morning, and the board has to approve it, which we did. So uh, the election is now over. We have a slate. I'm assuming there's no more nominations coming in from the floor, but if that's not the case, please let me know. Um, so assuming that there isn't, I'm going to go forward and announce that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, candidates are on the slate. Uh, we're all re-elected, we're elected or re-elected. Um, I'm pretty excited to let you know that we have uh, five new members uh, that weren't on the board before. Uh, Marty Hassel, Brad Herman, uh, Peter Schultz, uh, Bernie Zilch, and Gloria Geis. So uh, we have some, 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 some new blood on the committee. I'm look, looking forward to, to working with them. So I thought I just would uh, formally announce that to, so we can keep in, in line with our bylaws. So that's going to be our offices. Those and the other people that are on the board, all everyone's returning uh, except, unfortunately, uh, uh, Ben Kudo. Um, ben uh, is, is moving on, and uh, but he's uh, left us in good hands. He's, he's, he's still going to be around. He's advising us on how to set these meetings and record them and stuff like that. So I want to thank Ben for his service the last two years, and uh, and he's still going to be uh, around. He's not, but he has some family obligations, and then picked up a new job not too too long ago. So we certainly understand why he wouldn't be able to uh, to join us at uh, on the board for the next two years. So with that, uh, let me uh, let me turn it back to, uh, to Dana, and uh, Dana, you could continue the meeting. Thank you, John. Were you going to announce the the results? Oh, you're muted. John, you're muted. There you go. So, um, if you want, Dana, I I. I can read off the names of, of the people who were voted in. That's be pretty easy to do. I want to just spend a minute and do that. Um, I was reelected as, as the president and Paul Roberts as the vice president. Uh, Greg Chrissy was the uh, treasurer and Larry Woods was the secretary. Now, just so you know, that's considered the executive committee uh, in FISNY. And there were a number of members at large, there's eight of them, um, Sid uh, Shariti is, is, has, Shariti has, has uh, rejoined, and John Dockery. Um, new member, uh, Gloria Bryce, uh, Marty Hassel, Brad Herman, Ron Polito, has, uh, who was serving the last term, is, is re-upped. Peter Schultz has joined us, and, and Bernie Zilek, who uh, actually gave a presentation earlier this year, has also joined the board. So I think we have uh, we have twelve members now, uh, a bit more, a few more than we had before. So I think we're going to be able to do some good stuff this year. At least I hope. So, um, turn it back to you, Dana. Thanks, John. Um, 
Tonight, John is going to be sharing a presentation about the 50 years of FISNI. Um, I'll look back, look forward. Um, let me introduce John. He is the current president. He became a member of FISNI in 1979 and served on the board of directors back in the 1980s to the early 2000s, during which he held positions of program chair, vice president, and president. He rejoined the board of directors in 2018. He has a strong interest in 19th century images taken by Massachusetts photographers and has published a number of articles in the FISNI Journal. Uh, now retired, John worked 36 years for the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, where he held positions of senior marine biologist, deputy director of municipal services and deputy associate commissioner. He's been teaching part-time in the Marine and Environmental Science Department at Northeastern University for the past 13 years. Right up here, there's a square, red square. John earned a BS degree in fisheries biology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, an MS in marine biology from San Diego State University, and an MPA degree from Harvard. And John, I'm turning it over to you, so take it away. Thank you, Dana. I guess the first thing I have to do is share my screen and I hope it comes up okay. How's that look, okay? Yes, perfect. All right. um, I thought what I, uh, what I do today is, uh, is finish up our uh, 50th year. As, as probably all of you know, uh, we started in 1973 and we've been around for 50 years. And <clears throat> I'm in the process, uh, along with uh, Ron Polito, of putting together the 2023 uh, journal. And that's going to be a commemorative issue uh, about the history of FISNI over the past 50 years. And uh, I was talking with, uh, with, with Dana a few months ago, and I said, you know, maybe I'll give a preview of that um, to, to everybody in the last meeting of this year. So that's, that's what I thought I'd do here. Um, now, I, I should tell you that uh, the information that I'm gonna be talking about, most of it I got from all our old journals in the old snapshots. Uh, we do have gaps. So uh, we're still trying to fill in some of those gaps. So the information is the best that I have at hand, but it may be corrected uh, when we do come out with the journal, which hopefully won't be, be too much longer. Um, but it's, it's a, I think, a fascinating history. If you look at our organization, uh, it started in 1973, but um, you know, we weren't the first. In fact, we were the 14th regional organization. Back in the early 70s, in the late 60s, there was a frenzy almost of, of uh, all over the country of regional clubs showing up. Uh, the first one was actually in Rochester, New York, and that was in 1966. So by 1973, you know, which is only you know, seven years later or so, um, uh, there, there was there's already 14 organizations. Uh, by far, I think New York was was the busiest one. And um, it was also, I think that frenzy was caused by it was almost like a uh, uh, a trend or something. Uh, collectors of cameras uh, became very uh, active and people were showing up at antique stores and auctions and bumping into one another and of course talking to one another. And <clears throat> one of the best shows uh, that was in existence at the time was um, up in New York. And um, of course the people from Massachusetts and New England in general um, kind of complained uh, that why do we have to go to New York to find all these great cameras and, and, and images? And what I like to think is that they had somewhat of a civil conversation saying, you know, I have an idea. Why don't we form our own club? Um, and maybe so we we'll have to go to New York. Uh, but knowing uh, at least hearing stories about some of the people who formed our club, I think it was something more like this. I can go. Oops. Why isn't my slides working? Oops. Ugh. Probably more like this. <clears throat> Why do we have to go to New York to buy an antique hammer? And 
<clears throat> that was being discussed actually, uh, from what I can tell, um, back in the late 60s, uh, early 70s. Um, it was, if, if there are any founders, there was a lot of conversations going on, but there were any founders, I think it would have to be these four. Uh, and they actually mentioned a couple of times in later newsletters, uh, and it's uh, Dick Sanford, Byron Owens, Dick Boat, and Larry O'Shet. Uh, I did come across a quote in one of the early newsletters from John Craig, uh, who I'll you find out later was our first president. And uh, he said, uh, we all talked about it for more than two years, but they went out and did it, these, these four individuals. Um, and um, we, we, we still have, I know Dick Bolt is with us. We lost Larry Rochette uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Dick, uh, Byron Owens, I did try to contact him uh, a number of times. Uh, and I, 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 I'm hoping, I think he may be still alive, but I, I could never get a response. Uh, Dick Sanford has, has left us. Um, but if anybody started our club, it was these, these individuals here. A letter went out, I think it might have been uh, late January uh, in February 17, uh, 1973 that said, basically, there will be a meeting for all those interested in becoming charter members of the first New England Camera and Image Collective Society. And if you look at the four names on the bottom, it's those four that I, that, that I just mentioned. And um, uh, you have to ignore the, uh, the the spelling mistake here. Tucha events, <laughs> you know, it's, it just shows that I think um, uh, that it wasn't nearly as sophisticated back then. They really weren't sure if this thing was even going to take off at all. But it did have one thing in this letter I think that it caught the attraction of a lot of people. And uh, I'm not sure you can see my point, but it's, it, it's this sentence right here: "Bring your trade items." In swap session for a swap session. 68 people showed up at that meeting. And <clears throat> they were all almost all of them, for what I can tell, were camera enthusiasts. And they had uh, a great desire to collect cameras. But if you look at some of the earlier newsletters and and, and what became uh, the journal. There's always, from the very beginning, a very strong interest in education. And I think a lot of the reasons why um, uh, people started showing up more and more is because they could exchange stories. They could show what they had, what they picked up as a camera in a, at an auction or an, an antique store or something like that. Uh, and, and, and they would learn. And if you look at the first, I think at next slide is the first, oops. The, oh, this is where they met at the Edgewood Library in Framingham. And uh, we actually met there for about, I think the first 10 years, that's where we had the meetings. And that's where it all started. Now, when they had that first meeting, what they did is uh, they, 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 they made some announcements saying what they wanted to do. Then they had that swap and trade show. Um, and then after that was over, they set up a temporary board of directors that met upstairs at the Edgel Library. And it was, it was these folks, and there's three couples, uh, John and his wife, Valerie, Matt and his wife, Sharon, Larry and, and his wife, Lou, and Byron Owens, Dick Stanford, and Dick Boat. And from that meeting, they set up the infrastructure, really, that we still have today. Uh, they set dues at $10 uh, for individuals. And if you look at an inflation cal uh, uh, calculator, that would be about $63 today. Um, and they, they decide to have um, uh, a bylaw and set up bylaws. And if you look at the first meeting after that, Well, they also, let me, before I do far ahead of myself, <clears throat> what they did then, they knew they were just a temporary board. <clears throat> they said that um, we will be the board un until January, at which point we will have elections. And uh, they did that. 
But I think what's kind of interesting is that if you notice in the uh, in the in the temporary board, uh, there's, there's there's three women. When they had the election, uh, there were none. Uh, but they elected John Craig as president, Matt Eisenberg as a vice president, Dick Sanford as the secretary, Byron Owens as a treasurer. Now, one of the things I wondered about is how did they get all the names uh, to people to contact for this very first meeting? And from what I can tell, I think it was John Craig. John Craig was very much in the business of uh, selling and trading cameras. Uh, there were, as you know, like I said, there were a number of regional organizations, uh, and he belonged to all of them. And uh, they kind of asked John to get involved in this one. He was hesitant because he was afraid that it might take away from his business. Um, but he was convinced, uh, evidently, by uh, a, a couple of the original uh, members uh, who started the club, that uh, not only would it not slow down your business, it would probably even uh, add to it. And that turned out to be the case. Um, so uh, they elected him president, and he shared all the names. I think he had it in his probably some sort of Rolodex back then. And that's how all those invitations went out, as far as I can tell. Now, they were going to serve <clears throat> for the first year, at which point they were going to um, have another election. What they had to do, though, is get the bylaws in place, and that was not done in time. So what they did at the end of the first year, a nominating committee uh, made the decision to extend their term for another year. And they had one person, one additional person, and that was Henry Weisenberger. I'll get back to Henry in, uh, in a few minutes. Charter members. Uh, I don't think it's all of them, but I think maybe most of them. Um, and if you notice, um, uh, it's not too, too, too much gray hair there. Um, and you can almost tell by the smiles on the faces, a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, there's, there's a certain buzz in the air, I think, back then. Uh, that, uh, but, you know, that when, when something's new and fresh, um, I think there's a lot of excitement because you could go out to an antique store and, and find something that's really unusual in the camera uh, and, uh, and, and bring it back and share it. There's a lot of stories being shared from what I can tell at the very beginning. <clears throat> One of the things that I want to mention, let me go back a second. Well, very early on, no, this I found kind of fascinating. Now, remember, they met in April, right? Five months later, just five months, even before they had the bylaws in place, they decided to have their first show. And that was going to be at the 128 Hotel in Dedham. 50 tables, $12 a table. Yeah. And I, I think it shows, again, that thinking that... Um, the main purpose, I think, of, of forming this organization was to avoid having to go to New York to find to find good cameras. We have our local show. Uh, and there is some uh, some information, some of the early newsletters and everything that talks about setting this up, responsibilities, and seems like there's a lot of hands uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, to, to, to get this thing going. Uh, and for what I can tell, uh, it went pretty well. Now, most of these pictures are probably not the best, but this is what's printed in some of the old journals that we have. Uh, and this is the one at the 128 show. It seemed to be going pretty well. There is a, 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 an excerpt in one of the later newsletters uh, that, that came out right after the show that said it was a big success. And then it says, because we didn't lose money. In fact, they made, I think they said like $312 or something. Uh, so that, that I thought was interesting. Uh, so they had their own show. And I think also they, um, they started getting to know each other more, more and more, having a, a local place to meet. Um, later, of course, uh, we had a couple of show managers. Uh, the first one uh, was actually Matt Eisenberg, from what I can tell. Uh, Ed Shaw came in later. And uh, he really kind of expanded it. Uh, and uh, since then, we've had a, a few other um, shows uh, in, in different venues. Uh, 
uh, we had it at Waltham at the Armenian Club, place in Wakefield, uh, the vet, uh, uh, veterans is it in uh, club uh, organization. In and most recently, we've gone to uh, Newton High School. Now, <clears throat> this has been a, a stay, you know, one of the real pillars, I think, of FISNI for many, many years, uh, since the very beginning. Uh, it was an opportunity to uh, for these collectors to all come together, uh, sell their wares, buy things that they didn't have, maybe, uh, and, and share stories, collecting stories. And uh, I, I think that, that that's probably, if anything, one of the more critical parts of FISNI. Back then and now, uh, we'll be doing it again uh, at Newton High School. Uh, John Doherty uh, took over from Ed Shaw, and uh, he he's, we had a meeting this morning, and it's well on its way. We have uh, that that lease secured and everything. So the photographic show was definitely one of those things. It has really uh, been the glue that I think that has, has, has kept this organization together for the past fifty years. Now. We also had auctions. That was also very, very early on. They, they only had, I think, one or two shows that lasted one day, and then they went to a two-day show. And at the end of the second day, they used to have an auction. Uh, and what <clears throat> the auction was, most of the items in the auction, as far as I can tell, were co uh, consignments. People would bring in things, and uh, auction them off and FISNI would, would get a cut of that. It was as high as 25%, I think, at one time. Um, the other thing that, that FISNI did is they had started having member auctions. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, uh, and, and these would be uh, just usually uh, one time a year. And I think it was mostly in February. Uh, where travel might have been difficult uh, for people to, to get to the show. And uh, so you would show up at, at the program meeting where there'd be, where there'd be normally a guest speaker. And uh, in fact, there'd be an auction there and you could bring in your stuff and it would just be auctioned among uh, the members. Uh, the larger auctions, of course, generated a, a lot of buzz. Um, we, we did have donated items. Uh, we did have consignments. Uh, and anything else that, that, that people brought in. Um, you know, Larry Rochette was one of the main auctioneers there, as was uh, uh, Helda uh, Costa, who was no longer with us. Um, there used to be, uh, I know at one time, somewhere around 160 lots. It used to be an all-day affair for the most part. Um, now, what the, the auctions now, I quite as popular. And I think if you go back to why FISNI was formed, I think, uh, it basically provide a service. And for us to continue being successful, um, I think uh, we're gonna have to provide a service. And the auction did that, as did Photographica. Uh, now, over, over the years, uh, Instead of people having to go to shows or auctions to get stuff, they can go on eBay and other things like that. But auctions, um, you know, they're, they're not quite as popular. Uh, one of the problems, I think, is that we've been having one-day shows. Uh, the auction used to be at the second day. And oh, I'm sorry, the auction used to be at the evening of the first day. People were staying over anyways. <clears throat> but now, at the end of the one-day show, people, uh, the dealers were just going home. But it was an integral part of, of, of this need. And I think we're, having, we're going to be having discussions whether or not it's worth continue having them. Uh, is it part of our fabric? Uh, is, is it worth doing it money-wise? Um, is, is it worth the time and effort? So those are some of the discussions we're going to be having. I'll talk a bit more about that later, though. There was one auction that I, that I do want to point out. <clears throat> oh, this uh, Marty Jones is the auction there. Um, there's a lot of work takes place on um, on items that that are donated to Disney that we that we put in the auction now. In uh, a few people, uh, Dick Coolers in particular, and, and Joe Moses, Joe Walters, and Alan Goodrich, uh, they spend a lot of time uh, 
going through all the stuff that's donated before we auction it off, make sure the stuff works, maybe clean it up or whatever, catalog it and everything. It does take a lot of effort. It does take a lot of effort. Of course, we have Marty Jones. She's been our auctioneer uh, for the last couple of years and does a great job. There is one auction though I do want to point out to you. Um, this is uh, Dr. Hopkins here. Uh, he had a collection out in Kansas, mostly of Kodak equipment. And uh, of course, he, not surprisingly, knew Jack Naylor. And he mentioned to Jack that he uh, he wanted to, to get rid of his collection <clears throat> and uh, sell it maybe auction it off. Uh, Jack, uh, being typical Jack, uh, was knowledgeable enough and convinced uh, Dr. Hopkins to donate his entire collection to FISNI. Take the tax write off and he can do just as well, if not better. I had a conversation with Jack Naylor uh, not too long after the auction. And uh, no, actually it was a couple of years. And he said by then they had changed all the tax laws and it probably wouldn't have been as, as lucrative as, as it was back then. But what this collection did, it, it brought in a significant amount of money uh, to the FISNI. I think somewhere around $80,000. I'm still trying to research that exact number. <clears throat> and uh, Jack, uh, and, and when I, I had lunch with him uh, many years later, and, and he was telling me about some of, he thought the, the key things that FISNI did, um, and thought that the, the Skinner collection that that auction off uh, Hopkins uh, uh, collection was uh, one of those key moments and put F Fisney on pretty good financial uh, on a pretty good financial base. Now I mentioned that um, that there's um, uh, still about seventeen regional uh, organizations in. Uh, well, there was 17, and, and with that, I think it's down to like six or eight now. Uh, Ron Polito was actually researching this out, and he's going to have a pretty good detailed article about the history of these regional societies uh, when we come out to 2023 journal. Um, but what we can tell, I, I, I think um, a lot of them folded, including New York. Um, but I, I think Disney may be one of the ones uh, that are in better financial shape than the others. Uh, and it's probably a lot of it is because of the uh, the Hopkins collection. Um, uh, all the money that we take in, a lot of the money is uh, we, we have an investment account and we can try to live off the interest of that. Uh, as you know, we do take in money through memberships and uh, we, we're now on eBay and and we, we sell stuff. Uh, so we use that to run the organization, um, print the journal and uh, have our programs and things like that. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, the interest that we get from uh, the investment account is a big part of that. And I think we have to thank uh, Dr. Hopkins um, for helping us get to a financial situation where we can, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're in pretty good shape, I think. Now, the other thing too I found was interesting when I went back and started doing the research and all this, uh, not only, were the founders really interested in making it easy for people around here to collect cameras. They were very interested in, in the education component. And if you look, this is the first newsletter. This was in April of 1973. Um, and there's, there's a sentence here I, I, I just want to point out that at that meeting, instead of just talking about setting up the next show and stuff like that, they actually had a slide presentation showing the Ohio Camera Collective Society slide program number two. You know, again, I think there's a real thirst for information and knowledge. And I think that uh, is one of the reasons why programs from the very, very beginning became a large part of FISNI. Uh, this, the, uh, I'm not sure what happened the second meeting. In the third meeting, Mike Kessler came out from, from California. Michael Ur, if I'm pronouncing that right, from Geneva, Switzerland, with speakers. Uh, and every, uh, every month, uh, it just seemed like uh, they got some fantastic speakers, hundreds of them. Now, we do have a database of, I think, uh, I've identified almost all of the speakers and all of the topics and that I'm hoping to be able to, to get them all into the uh, into the journal. 
Uh, I do have some gaps, though. Uh, I think in, from 1985 to 1987, and then another gap in the early 90s. So uh, I, I still have some more work to do. If anybody has any of those old journals or newsletters or something, I'd really appreciate if you let me know. If you have them all, let me know, because if I, we do have gaps, I would just love to fill. One of the most important components of these monthly programs was the show and tell. And what really blew me away is on this particular one, this is one that Eaton uh, Lothrop spoke, there was 21 show and tell. Now, <laughs> you think about it, uh, I'm not sure how, I, 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 most of you are probably aware of that, but what it was was before the actual speaker came on board, if you had something interesting, you would go up there at, at the front and, and, and just show it. Just maybe spend like three, four, five minutes explaining what you found, uh, maybe take a question or two, <clears throat> and then sit down. But I'm thinking you had 21 speakers, each one talking for, you know, say, five minutes by the time you, you know, one sits down, the other one gets up there. You talk about an hour and a half. And <laughs> interestingly, there is an early newsletter in which uh, one of the board members suggested that they had the show and tell after the main speaker, because the main speaker, of course, had to sit through all of these show and tells uh, be before he or she could get up there and talk. So, But again, I think it demonstrates uh, the thirst for knowledge, as well as the thirst for interesting pieces of equipment that has been one of the main fabrics uh, of FISNI. Oops. Um, this I thought was kind of interesting. <clears throat> the emphasis at the very beginning um, was definitely on cameras. If you look at the show and tell, almost all cameras. Uh, if you looked at the Photographica show, it's, it's mostly all cameras, with some exceptions. As far as I can tell, it wasn't until the 1980, <clears throat> 81 meeting if you look down here on November 2nd, I can move this. Charles Lennon gave a talk on F. Holland Day. And as far as I can tell, that was the first program that we had in which the topic was a photographer and not a piece of equipment of camera. So that's, that's almost 10 years into our, our, our organization before we had that. I thought that was really interesting. And the emphasis, I think, still is on uh, equipment and cameras, although most of the talks it seen, most of the program meetings, I think uh, at least half of them, if not more, are going towards uh, other things, photo history, uh, photographers, uh, you know, and, and, and such. <clears throat> now, we always had a meeting, uh, as I mentioned, at the EDU, but after 20 years, after 20 years, uh, that building needed some serious uh, uh, renovations and repairs. So we started moving elsewhere. The first place was a Natick Inn on Route 9. Uh, and this is a picture of that first meeting. Um, some fantastic talks over the years. Uh, the, the, I, I tried to get a list of all the speakers that I that I made up so far, it, it, it turned out to be seven pages. I didn't want to make seven slides of just, just names and topics, but uh, hopefully that will all be in the, uh, the 2023 journal. Um, this is our own uh, Ed Shaw. Uh, he's a huge loss. We lost him a few years ago. Uh, he's talking about Peru. That's, that's why he has his shirt on. Uh, we've had talks on using 3D glasses. Uh, uh, Grant Wilmer came out from the East End House. Uh, Jack Neal has given a lot of talks. Um, I did single out this one, though. Um, where is it? What am I looking for here? Second. I knew this was in a slide I was hoping. I thought I had the slide. When the first woman, very early on, there was a talk by John and Valerie Craig. I'm not sure what Valerie's role was in there, but we didn't get a, um, 
a woman Venta solo until the early 80s, as far as I can tell. Publications is also uh, an integral part of FISNI at the very, very beginning, from the very beginning, I should say. We started off with a newsletter. You've already seen a couple um, uh, uh, slides of that, and they were pretty, pretty rough, the first couple, but it didn't take long. This is just November of 73. They had a second a little bit fancier. Um, if you notice, this seemed to be the logo at the time. Uh, this showed up a lot at the newsletter, and it continued on um, for a while. And then with the photo nostalgia, uh, this this came about when <clears throat> the uh, the editor uh, changed to uh, actually it was Jack Billington and his wife. Uh, I think were the ones when they became editors. Uh, they the name got changed. Uh, and we went to the journal, of course. And then we went to uh, snapshots. Now, <clears throat> when, when, prior to snapshots coming out, the journal used to contain a lot of information, just update information that you would generally find in a newsletter in Photo Nostalgia. Um, 1996, this is volume one, number one in September. They decided to separate those out to have the journal have more information about uh, uh, cameras and the photo history. Uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, the uh, information of upcoming programs and stuff like that will go into snapshots. Uh, we've had a number of, uh, uh, the, the, the first editor of this was uh, um, Pat McMillan. Um, she handed off to David uh, DeGene and uh, now we have a uh, Bonnie Legalman doing it. She's been doing it for years and doing a fantastic job. Um, this is when we went from <clears throat> Rob Pratt was actually the first one to put together the newsletter. Um, and photo nostalgia. Um, when they changed the name, they wanted a new name for it, and. Something I, I I didn't know. It was a guy named Gary Griswold, who I'm not familiar with. He's the one who suggested the idea that they change a the name to newsletter. Uh, they wanted to change the name. He came up with photo nostalgia. And uh and the board that initially failed to recognize him for that contribution, realized their mistake. And when they did publish it uh, not too long after the name changed. Uh, they gave him a free membership for a year. It's somewhat of an apology, I think. Uh, this symbol you see a lot, this camera on photo nostalgia. The symbol, the, the logo that we have today, didn't show up to much later. But, uh, they had for years, getting the journal out, all the photo nostalgia, used to have the mailing parties. Um, Ruth Tamazian was one that was, uh, she was a huge fan of this. And even they were talking about, you know, there was organization, uh, there were companies out there that you would just send the printing stuff to and, and they'd print it up and they would send it out automatically to, to the membership with labels and everything. Uh, Ruth pushed hard, I think to really her credit, say, no, let's, let's, let's continue getting together on this. For many years, Dan Jones used to host this party and we meet at his house and sit around and, and he, he supply uh, uh, the coffee or whatever. Uh, and we'd have uh, a, a good time just communicating. Yeah, though, uh, it, it did get into uh, more articles. Uh, and this one here is uh, one by Larry Rochette, um, the, the stereo photography in, I think, at Brockton, Massachusetts. They had crossword puzzles in them once in a while. They had ads. And in one of them to say, a display ad of this size, how you large this actually, uh, was $3, a full page ad, $20, half page 12, quarter page seven. These are some of the ads that showed up. This logo here, as far as I can tell, this is the first time this appeared in FISNI. And I think it was developed for the 10th anniversary. 
Um, now, if you look just a year later, you see that symbol up here for the first time in the journal. Uh, I still have to do some more research on this to find out who actually came up with that design. I'm hoping to be able to get that done um, before the 2023 journal has to be wrapped up. But we'll see. It hasn't changed that much since then. It may look like the journal to you folks, but it really isn't. Uh, it changed. Volume one, number one, in 1984, July, August, was Photographica Journal. Now, what this was, it was a, a, a merger of uh, FISNI with the New York Society. And they're going to get input from a number of other societies. And you see them listed here. And the idea was to come up with a journal that everybody was going to make a contribution to. Uh, and it would be actually um, uh, overseen and coordinated by uh, uh, FISNI slash New York. Uh, I should say New York slash FISNI because uh, New York's listed at least first on the editorial offices. Uh, Jack Naylor was very much involved in this. It was his, uh, he, it was he who suggested it to the board and the board uh, voted on it. Um, <clears throat> it didn't take long, though, for them to realize that most of the stuff uh, wasn't going to come from these other societies, uh, the Delaware one and American Photographic. Uh, they just wouldn't make that much contribution. In the New York and uh, FISNI started uh, doing the great bulk of the work and uh, most of the articles related to those two societies. Uh, but they hung in there. Uh, Evidently, there were some communication problems. There's no, there's no computers back then. Uh, so everything had to be mailed by hand and everything. And it didn't last all that long. By 1987, uh, in that issue, they announced that uh, and this is the final issue of Photographica Journal. And they're going to go back to having this separate uh, issues in New York and um, in the other ones, too, in FISNI. Um, I'm not sure how long after that uh, New York uh, folded. Uh, George Gilbert, of course, was a huge part of that um, in New York society. This is when it came the journal. This is the first one that was issued after uh, we broke up that, that merger. And this was it. Um, <clears throat> Look at some of the titles of the articles. Uh, it was a lot more focused on, on research type stuff. But they also had other stuff too, exposing a fraud. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II playing tag. It wasn't the, 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 the research type, uh, uh, historical research articles that we have uh, in, in uh, today's journal. Um, they also had book reviews. This is one on union cases that came out, I think. Um, the history of the dye transfer process. Now, this is still in the journal, right? Uh, the Spooner Brothers of Springfield by, by, uh, by Dick Bolt, who is um, who's still with us, hopefully at this meeting. He talked about the, uh, the Spooner Brothers, took over the Cooley Studio in Springfield, Mass. Oops. Didn't have, oh, where is it? Yeah, the, the journals that we have today, uh, this is 2021, uh, they, they more or less focus in detail on just a couple of subjects, usually, uh, usually three or four subjects. Uh, this is one that was on the development of the hexagon, uh, hexagon satellite. Um, Phil Presso, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, uh, did a great job describing the, uh, the camera system. This is fascinating in that. Um, and then uh, Ron Polito did a masterful job uh, describing the uh, T.E. Ma contribution to uh, the Isabel Stewart uh, Gardner Museum. Uh, so the, the, the articles have become longer. Uh, there aren't as many, much information about other things. That information is now showing up in snapshots. Uh, so it is different. It has evolved. The thing that happened uh, in FISNI is uh, field trips. Now, I, I I was always, you know, when I first got involved with FISNI, I knew there were field trips, and I thought 
that they uh, go back to the very beginning of FISNI. Uh, it turns out, as far as I can tell, that's not true. As far as I can tell, the first field trip was in 1989. Now, I may be wrong on that, because like I said, there are some gaps in the journals. Uh, so um, don't, don't quote me on this. Uh, don't hold me totally responsible for it. Uh, now, the, there was a, uh, a couple efforts. New York still has their photographic show. I mean, the, up at the Eastman House, uh, John Eastman House runs it. Uh, and they, they did, FISI members did take a bus up there. But I, I wasn't really, uh, you know, so more or less carpooling. I wasn't really calling that a field trip. As far as actually organizing the field trip, the first one was to Thailand. And, uh, and we've gone all, all over, really, uh, parts of the world and local. Um, but if, what I thought was really interesting is we made five trips to China. I think it was five. One, two, three, four, five. We went to Peru, because Thailand. Um, a lot of these trips, um, especially the ones international, uh, is all the work of, of two people, uh, Ed Shaw in particular, but Ruth Tamazian has her fingerprints all over it too. Uh, they are the ones who, who arranged it. Um, Thailand was, uh, was going to have their own photo museum. Jack Neela got involved in that. And that, I think, is one reason why they ended up going to Thailand first. And that kind of set a precedence. And then uh, um, and Ruth and, and Ed Shaw just, just picked up the ball and, and went back there. We also got involved in, uh, well, here are some of the people that went, went to Thailand. Uh, this Greg Chrissy and Ray Sorois. Uh, so many people are still around. Uh, I'm not sure who came up with this name. I think it might have been Ruth. But after... <laughs> Edward got so involved and said called an adventure. Uh, I think it was Ruth who coined this name, Adventure. And Ed did a masterful job in setting these things up. And they were fairly inexpensive, too. I think the first trip to China, well, he, well this one here was $2,300. And that includes transportation from New York, uh, meals, and, and all that. I mean, now you couldn't even get a plane ride for that, I don't think. But fantastic. Uh, and uh, again, we did go to a lot of local places. We went to the uh, the PEM. Uh, I can't see the bottom. But the last one that we did in 2023 by, by Dana was back at the PEM. We went to the JFK Library a couple of times. Um, we went to people's houses. Uh, Marty Jones, uh, 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 Alan Cattell, and Jack Naylor. We had uh, 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 field trips to his place in Brookline a number of times. Uh, so it was, it, that became part of Disney's fabric, I think. But um, for a relatively short amount of time. I mean, it was in 1989. The, the uh, uh, Disney was well established by then. Another one here. Oops. No. One of the, thing, the other things that Ed did, which I thought was a very nice contribution um, and, a, and a nice, I think, star on the forehead for, for Disney is he took a sincere interest in helping preserve uh, some of the photographic work uh, for China. A lot of that stuff got destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. And Ed was very active in, 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 in collecting uh, the pieces and uh, there were uh, uh, at least one or two of the trips. Uh, he had quite a stash of stuff um, uh, from China that was only taken in China uh, that people had in this country and he brought it back to them, donated it back to them. Which I thought was really nice. Went to Peru. There's Ruth right there. Um, Check the time. I don't want to run too much over 8.20. Okay, let me, let me get going on this. Let me talk about the offices for a second. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, 88 different members of FISNI have become offices. Um, and uh, that, 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 that's amazing. Now, I, 
I think the first elected officer was, um, let's see if I can find it here, it was a treasurer. Ah, Claire, right here. Claire Billington was the first elected officer as a treasurer. Uh, the first female, I'm sorry, elected officer uh, as, as a treasurer. Um, and uh, in the 2023 journal, one of the things that's going to be in there is uh, we have interviews with, with a few people who are charter members, one being Jack Billington. And I, I got to talk to Jack and, and Claire about that. So I'm going to be sharing some of that information uh, in, in that interview when we print that one. Um, what really kind of amazed me, though, <clears throat> is um, Weisenberger. Now, I mentioned before that when, when the nomination committee decided to extend the term of, of the 1974 board through 1975, they added a name to that board, and that was Henry Weisenberger. Henry ended up serving as an officer for 44 years. Uh, of course, he died uh, a few years ago, but I figured out that 94% nine, nine, of the time that Fisney existed, Henry was an officer in some capacity. Uh, he was uh, the president more than any other uh, member. Um, the the uh, 44 years, the, the, the person who comes, comes in second as far as the number of years of serving as an officer is Ruth, Ruth Tamazlin. She serves a number of capacities, including the presidency, a number of times. Um, actually, Ruth and Jack Naylor, uh, they served in FISNI as officers for 26 years. Um, Lou Legelman, uh, who may be with us, I hope, uh, today, tonight, uh, he, he'd, be, he'd be fourth. Uh, after Henry, Ruth, and Jack, he stood for 20 years as an officer. Uh, John Dockery, uh, who I, I think is joining us tonight, and of course is running Photographica, he'd be next at 20 years. Uh, I'm sorry, 17 years. And Ed Shaw, uh, Alan Goodrich, Adrian Levesque, and, uh, and myself have served for uh, about 15 years. Um, now I want to take this opportunity too to, to mention that there are a lot of people who uh, so very important functions in FISNI who are not officers. Uh, of course, the one that comes right to mind right away, of course, is Dana. Uh, and then Alan Goodrich uh, comes to mind. He, he does a lot of work in the warehouse. Alan Goodrich uh, still does a lot of work. And even though they're not members, they're volunteers. Uh, Holly uh, 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 Woodsworth, uh, uh, Willington, uh, does the school outreach program. Uh, and she's not an officer. So just because they're not officers does not mean there aren't a number of people who are playing critical roles uh, in, in FISNI even today. So many officers here. <clears throat> Larry Rochette's interesting. You know, he's one of the four original members. Uh, I wondered if some, take, if some took on a more of a role than others in the original four. And if any of them did, I think it might have been Larry. The reason I say that is about six months after the organization was formed, they decided to give what I think is the very first lifetime membership, free lifetime membership. Uh, the board voted to give it to Larry. And they didn't mention the other three founders. So I suspect that uh, Larry was really, really critical in forming the organization. Uh, John Craig was also another person that was critical. Uh, in, 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 in keeping the thing going at the beginning. He was very well respected. And I think he brought in a lot of names for people for speakers and things like that. Uh, here's Ruth. It's the first uh, female president of FISNI. Um, we've only had two. The second one, of course, was um, Marty Jones. Two that he should be very proud of. There's, there's been a number of people, and I, I hesitate putting this slide up because I know I'm going to leave at least some people out. But uh, well, there's a couple of Bibles out there in, in the photographic uh, library. And, and one is the, the, the directory of Massachusetts photographers put together by Chris Steele and Ron Polito. 
Paul Wing's book on stereoscope, uh, Alec Cattell on home movies, uh, and Richard Stanford, one of the four original ones. He has, he has four books. Uh, it says on Cape Cod, but I think all of them are, are photographic related. Huge contributions, not only to FISNI, but also to the uh, photographic history uh, in this country in general. Let me just say just a couple words about the future of FISNI. Um, I am optimistic, uh, but I think it's a strong organization in some respects, but it's also very fragile, I think, in others. One of the problems that if you go through all the old journals and things like that, uh, there are complaints about uh, there's not enough help. Uh, and <clears throat> this is a type of organization, if you look at the history, just one or two people have made a huge difference. Ed Shaw comes to mind right away. Uh, you know, when he decided to, to do the field trip stuff, it just took off. Uh, and if he decided not to do that, there probably wouldn't have been any field trips for the most part. Um, so I, I, I think they're in good shape. Uh, the thing that makes me a little bit nervous, if you remember what I said before, Disney has flourished, uh, mainly because uh, I think of two things uh, that were in place when it was originally formed. It provided services in two main areas. It allowed collectors to get together uh, and share things conveniently. You didn't have to go far away to Chicago or New York to take, pick things up from other dealers. And um, they provided information. And that's characterized by uh, the newsletter, photo nostalgia, the journal, um, and, and such. Um, <clears throat> both those things, a lot of people don't need FISNI for anymore. Uh, we have eBay now. Uh, we have other places that people can get things and sell things on, on auctions. Um, uh, as far as information goes, information that you could only get for FISNI at that one time. Um, it um, off the internet now. I forget who the speaker was, um, but there's one speaker <clears throat> that was speaking, this goes back to the uh, late 80s, uh, 1980s, and he was invited in. At that time, I was I was a program chairman, and uh, he came in from some other state. I forget where it was. I feel embarrassed. I'll, I'll remember eventually. But he said uh, he, he feels this is the only place that he feels somewhat intimidated uh, given a, a talk it was at FISNI. He says, because I know there's so many people in the audience that knows more than I do about the topic that I'm a specialist in. And he said, uh, it, there's never been a collection of, of brain power on photograph, on cameras, especially the photographic history and all, and as is when you would attend a FISNI meeting. Uh, but people can get that information from other sources now, you know, so that, Providing a service, I don't think, is as needed as it was at the early stages of FISNI. Um, the other thing, too, is if you look at most of the, certainly the FISNI board, and probably the members in general, uh, we're all older now. Uh, and some of us don't have uh, uh, the time or the energy or the skill levels uh, to keep up with, with what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that kind of worries me. Uh, I became a lot more optimistic. But this last election, when uh, I found that we we're going to be able to add on five new members, uh, so that was good. Uh, but I guess I also want to make make this a plea that the reasons, the main reason Disney has been so successful over the last fifty years, is the people, the people who took initiatives, uh, who saw a problem and, and found a way to solve it and to make a contribution. And if if we if we don't have those people continually coming in. Uh, FISNI will probably end up like most of the other regional photographic things. Uh, they, they, they're probably going to fold. Uh, I haven't seen any real evidence that yet happening, but I would think that in these other societies, uh, and there's been at least 16, I think, who have folded, um, they, they probably face the same thing, you know, the same issues. Uh, I had talked to a couple people now and then in these other clubs, and uh, some of them very strong. I'm thinking of Michigan. Uh, of course, the Canada one is very strong. Uh, Ohio, I'm not sure. Ohio is one of the early ones. I think FISNI, if you look at their bylaws, I haven't done this yet, but I get a feeling uh, they look very closely at the bylaws that Ohio had on their club. 
you know, so hopefully it's still around too. So I am optimistic, uh, but I'm, I'm also cautious. And I'm hoping that uh, that people, if they have any time at all, just a little bit of time that they feel they can donate to FISNI, not necessarily being an officer, uh, just helping us out doing certain things. Uh, that would be really appreciated. And I think it would secure the future for FISNI for hopefully uh, another 50 years. So, okay, I think I'm out of time. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if there's uh, any questions on anything. I, um, I'm going to stick a link into the chat because our January Zoom is going to be a show and tell that you can sign up for online. Um, you don't have to be a FISNI member to do this. Like, um, as John was saying, we've had some fantastic meetings in the past where folks have gotten up before the speaker and shared something briefly. And we're doing the same thing, but on Zoom this year on January 7th. So there's a link to a little uh, site where you can sign up with your name, your email, and your topic. But um, just wanted to stick that in there. And I also wanted to invite everyone to unmute and give John a round of applause for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great job. Thank you, John. It was wonderful. And you can see how involved, um, how many things there are to do in Disney. So if you have any questions about what you'd like to do or what you can do, John, can they email president at Disney.org? Yeah, definitely. Um, and also, uh, if, if you have any of the old uh, journals and newsletters, because uh, we do have gaps, uh, if you just let me know that, uh, and I could uh, let you know where we have gaps, and uh, hopefully you may, you may be able to help us out in filling in some of the information that, that we're lacking right now. So. Yeah. Left. Um, does anyone have a question? Uh, John, this is uh, Chuck Chuck Fail from uh, Michigan uh, Photographic Historical Society. Yes, yeah, hi Chuck. Do you have any uh, physical meetings between your members? Uh, we have, uh, uh, for example, we have a monthly luncheon at a, at a restaurant that any any of our members or anybody can come. To. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that you can do, or, or are you so uh, geographically diverse where that wouldn't make sense? Yeah, well, it, uh, we stopped having uh, physical meetings uh, at the Women's uh, uh, Club in, in Newton when COVID hit. Um, and that's when we decided to go to Zoom. And that, that was uh, almost like a, a two-edged sword. Uh, we, we start meeting um, you know, together. Um, and having the show and tells and everything. But what it did do, it opened up a whole new audience for us, people who are former members, uh, are people interested in the FISD that can now attend our meetings on Zoom. So to answer your question, uh, what I want to do next year, uh, next uh, uh, calendar year, is to have a couple meetings uh, that would be in-house. And that would also, we could put up on Zoom. And we had to find that location. Uh, and uh, so that that that's the plan right now, Chuck, because I think we really are losing something by not meeting in house uh, and getting to know you know people face to face, uh, getting to see them face to face more often. Um, I agree. And um, shout out to anyone who knows of a venue that has a good setup for both in-person attendees and also to make a hybrid meeting locally. Um, in the Boston area. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that would be great. Um, I, I know, that, I guess what I'm thinking of as a model, I, as Dana mentioned, I teach at Northeastern and in the classrooms, uh, they have a, a room where they have microphones hanging from the ceiling, uh, as well as a, uh, a camera, uh, a pretty sophisticated system 
And if I'm speaking as a professor giving a lecture, the camera focuses on me. If 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 uh, if one of the students asks a question, the, the camera automatically follows the voice and will focus in on the uh, on the student. And then when I answer the question, it goes back to me. Sound systems is great. Uh, so uh, that's the type of quality I think I would like. Uh, if we can, uh, if we can find some some place like that, somewhat reasonable price, uh, that that would be ideal. We also would want to try to keep it around the 128 belt somewhere, so people. That'd be great. We lost you there for a bit, John. What oh, was sorry. that? Um, not sure what what part you missed uh you you mentioned 128 and then you cut out oh, briefly. okay yeah uh we, we we'd probably like to meet around the, uh, the 128 belt somewhere uh you know, you know that's outside of boston easy to get to uh parking would be uh, right there and everything uh, and there are probably some hotels out there that have these facilities we just haven't researched it yet but uh but uh, to, 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 to back to, to, to the question, yeah, I would really like to get back involved in having some in-house meetings. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we also could um, be looking at another field trip later this year, trying to um, investigate some venues um, that we might be able to go to an exhibit like we did at PEM. Um, and uh, again, if anyone has suggestions or would like to present at one of our meetings on Zoom, um, you can contact programs at Disney.org and uh, propose your topic. Um, I see Ron is asking, what about public libraries for a meeting? Many have video equipment of the type that John mentioned. That's a good idea. Um, yeah. Um, to investigate that. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Um, so any anyone who has a suggestion for a speaker or would like to present themselves, please let us know. Um, in February, after the show and tell meeting in January, we're going to have Trenton Carls, who's the head librarian, and Megan Squibb, who's the photo archivist of the Cape Ann Museum, present on their uh, photo archive of the Gloucester Daily Times, which they have digitized and have access to online. So they're going to talk about that project and working with such a large collection. Um, so that will be in February on the fourth. And yeah, I, I see that there's like eight people in chat. Uh, is there anything there that I should be talking about? Um, I think the last question was from Ron. I was also going to stick in oh, our okay. our Instagram. Uh, link photo history now on Instagram. Please <clears throat> give us a follow. Um, we'll be posting things about the meetings. We'll be posting things about cameras that will be on eBay for auction, and um, we can uh, share um, images that you might have. So please um, get in touch with us if you'd like to share anything on Instagram. Yeah. And also, I would encourage you to, to again, uh, visit our website. We, we did an upgrade on that very recently. Um, and it's an incredible amount of information on there. I, I want to th thank uh, Mike Lenton and his folks uh, for putting all that together. I, I, I think it gives you an indication, too, of what we're trying to do in FISNI, be relevant, provide information they could probably not get in other places. And the website, I think, is well on its way of doing that. And Ben has just sent a message uh, acknowledging, would like to send thanks to Lou Regalman, Lou Regalman, who is retiring from the board. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, Lou was. Thank you, Lou. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, he he's one of the longest serving members, uh, 20 years. Um, and then you figure that's almost half of his in existence. You know, so, yeah. And, you know, he, he may be retiring, uh, but Lou still shows up at our warehouse uh, quite frequently and helps out there. And, you know, I, I ran out of time, but that was, let me, if I could just spend just another 30 seconds. The other big thing that has changed in FISNI over the years is uh, we always had somewhat of a storage capacity uh, 
Jack Neela had a storage locker. We used to keep stuff. Over the years, that has grown tremendously. And now the warehouse, we call it the warehouse. It's in, it's in Waltham. Uh, it, it's room after room of, of just equipment and cameras and stuff like that. And this is where, when we get donations, we have a donation policy uh, that, that we implement. And a lot of this stuff goes out to schools. Some of it gets, gets, gets put aside uh, for the photographica show, the dollar table, uh, the, uh, what we call, used to call the whitey table. Other stuff will go out on eBay. Uh, but people like uh, Dick Coolish and, and Lou and, uh, and there's a bunch of other people. Uh, Joe Moses is very much involved in that. Uh, Paul Roberts, uh, uh, Joe Walters. Uh, uh, they, they, they go through all this stuff and very carefully uh, make sure everything works the way it's supposed to. And it's become a major source of income uh, for Disney, uh, major being a relative term. Um, so uh, it, it's, it, it's been good. And if anybody, if you're ever thinking of downsizing your collection or, or turning it over, uh, Disney would be more than happy to, to take it and make sure it finds a good home. We take that very seriously. Um, and uh, so uh, if you would keep us in mind for things like that, and it's going for a good cause. If you put something up on eBay uh, and get some money for it, uh, then uh, that 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 goes for paying our speakers and paying our rent and uh, uh, publishing the uh, the journal and things like that. So it goes to a good cause. So I encourage you to think of us uh, that time ever comes. So, Oh. And again, um, there are so many things that you could help out with. So, I mean, there's a great history of people being involved in Disney as various offices and, you know, in various capacities for long periods of time. And it's uh, it's really rewarding. And we want to get back to seeing people in person, too. Um, that's really important. And um, again, um, it is the holidays. So, um, John, at the end of the meeting, um, as we close up, if you want to stop sharing your screen so everyone can see each other, we can have a few minutes of holiday greetings for December. Thank you again. It was a great presentation. I could just figure out how to stop the... Uh... It's at the bottom. Stop sharing your screen. The green. Stop share. There it is. There you go. Good. Good. Now I can see everyone. Yeah, um, I would like to take the opportunity to wish everybody a happy holiday too. Um, uh, so, and happy new year. It's going to be an exciting one. I'm looking forward to 2024. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So. Uh, Cindy has a message that Lou used to be very active in the Michigan Photographic Historical Society before he moved to FISNI. Um, and thank you for that, Lou. John, um, Dana, if I may mention one thing. Um, uh, we, uh, north of the border at the Photographic Historical Society of Canada, um, would like to um, pass on our congratulations to your 50-year-old organization from our 49-year-old organization. <laughs> and as, <laughs> it's interesting when, as Chuck speaks about his, uh, the, the Michigan group's uh, um, uh, situation with programs, for instance, and meeting on Zoom versus meeting in person. We, we face the same situation. Um, horrible as COVID was and is, it did um, force us to go into Zoom meetings, but to expand our horizons incredibly and not just have people attend from all over the world, but speakers come in and mm. speak from Vienna and Reykjavik and all over the US and all over Canada. Yes. So that part is wonderful. So we, we basically, we're sort of leaning towards, okay, we're going to keep staying on Zoom until we can find an ideal venue from which we could, you know, essentially broadcast in a hybrid way. And we've looked at libraries and we have to find a brand spanking new one because they'll tell us right off the hop, oh yeah, we have we have Wi-Fi here, but it's really, really spotty. And and by the way, we know that your meeting runs from 8 p.m. till 10 and, and we're good to have you stay till 10 or 10.30 or 11 o'clock. 
but just remember when we turn out the lights in the rest of the building, we shut off the Wi-Fi at nine o'clock. <laughs> so we're dealing with that. And, and I got to tell you, once, once we figure out how we've done it and we will, we will share this with you and our, and our friends in Michigan as well. It's a, it's a universal uh, problem challenge situation. And a day does not go by when people uh, ask me, when, when can we meet again in person? Um, we have our fairs, um, our auctions are gangbusters. They're crazy busy. Um, and, and sad, you know, it's, it's kind of a melancholy thing because usually if we have a big auction, it, you know, given our demographics or given demographics period, um, somebody has died. Um, and, and we are contacted by widows or, or the kids to auction off this stuff. And, um, People love it. Fine, they get some deals, but they get to meet mm. and really rub shoulders. So I, I get it. It's it's a problem all three of our organizations face, and uh, we're we're looking to, like I say, we've got people working on it. Um, you know, people who wear way pointier hats than mine. And uh, when we figure that out, hopefully soon we'll we'll share it with the world. So, but uh, congratulations on your fiftieth. This is uh, right. this is wonderful, sir. Uh, Thank you, Clint. I, I look it. forward to uh, meeting all all you all in uh, in person soon. So, because I'm into that. So, okay. thank, thank you, you much. Clint. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and all that good stuff <laughs> from from <laughs> those of us who are just a little bit closer to Santa than than you. <laughs> <laughs> Physically, 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 too, also, physically, yeah. physically. Oh, okay, yeah. But you know, being a kid at heart and stuff like that. Mm. Good. good stuff. Um, good stuff. We um, we used to have like the the coffee get together before the meeting would start, and that was also really mm. nice. And I do miss that. So, um, <clears throat> Graphica is great because it's, there's so many people there. You can talk, you can browse. It's a wonderful event. Um, but it's, it's really great to have a monthly gathering and we haven't had that in a while. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of sad. We've made wonderful friends all over the world. Well, like this, this event is an absolutely prime example. I, I look around, I see people from all over the map. And people who under, you know, certain circumstances, you know, they, you know, maybe the, the public transit isn't that good, you know, maybe they don't want to hop in the car. Um, and and we're at this point, you know, the genie's out of the bottle, we, we can't stop the online thing. Right. So we've got to figure mm -hmm. out a way of having both and, and maybe to a certain extent, having the people who are sitting home, yeah, maybe a little bit jealous and figuring out a way of getting their themselves down to the meeting once in a while. <laughs> Speaking of that, when is the, the your show, the Photographica, is that the 24th of April? Is, is that what I think I saw? I, th um, I think so. 20th of April. Oh, the 20th? Okay. Thank you. I put that in. Maybe I'll make a road trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah let's do great. it. Let's do um, it, Cindy. All the, all oh, okay. The, You're on. Chalk. <laughs> <laughs> all the dates uh, and the snapshots issues can also be found on Disney.org. Okay. I think I looked it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you can check out what the future meetings coming up will be and um, what date Photographica will be. Again, at Newton North High School. Yeah, that may be that may be different. I, I think the date that was thrown out is the Disney one, but I think the question was when is the Canadian one, right? Oh no, no that's that was uh the Fisney one. Oh the Fisney, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I, oh, Cindy, I don't know yeah, you have to come out. Are. <laughs> Ours our dates are are we're we're trying to set them in stone so the same essentially this the same weekend in the fall and the same weekend in the spring in other words um the sunday after our canadian thanksgiving in october and then the last sunday of may so and we're trying to stick to that as okay. as we did for you know many 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 years and people got very used to it certainly i did you know I, I didn't really have to know the date all i needed to say was 
week after Canadian Thanksgiving, last Sunday in May. Boom, done, next. But your mm-hmm. your show is is only a five hour drive from Montreal, which kind of works for me. I, oh, and nice. I, I got to tell you something. I, I know he's not here, so I can tell you this. I have a little confession to make. <laughs> I, I could usually convince the guy who, who ran the Montreal show to do his Sunday, his show on the Sunday after your Saturday show. So, like I say, it's only a five hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Well, I, I, I hate to say it, but we do have to wrap up. Um, it's been wonderful to hear John talk about Disney's past and looking toward the future. And so please keep, keep your, um, keep your attention on Disney.org. And again, if you have any interest in anything new, you'd like to bring to Disney or volunteer in one of our other departments that um, we talked about, please uh, touch base with John at president at Disney.org. And happy holidays. It's really good to see everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, basically the format for January will be to sign up for a five to six minute show and tell, can be camera, can be an image, you can share your screen, can be a story, um, anything that you would like to share with the membership. And we look forward to seeing you then. So thanks everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.